1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you would look there please, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This morning and tonight we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11. And so I want us to begin this morning by reading with verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's ask God's blessing on our time in his word today. Lord, we joyfully confess that without your power, without your spirit, without your gracious help, we cannot preach this morning. We are inadequate for such a task. And so, Lord, we look to you and we ask for your blessing. Help me, Lord, to call to mind easily the things that you've taught me this week. Help me to give easy expression to the things that you would have your church to hear this morning. Help me, Lord, to be true and faithful to what you intended when you gave us this passage. And then take that in hand, Lord, and deal with our hearts in a way that changes us. Lord, bless this morning. We will thank you for what you, the living God, alone can do and accomplish. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. True worship requires the whole person. True worship requires all of us. Where there is true worship, you have a mind that is informed with the truth You have a heart that has been captured by that truth. Your affections have been captured by the truth. And you have a will that is set on walking in those truths. That is what the Christian life is meant to be. And nothing less than that. Your mind, your heart, your will, all set on worshiping God. That's true worship. And yet all of the world, and if we're honest this morning, even sometimes it is to be found in our own life, you find believers who struggle in one or more of more than one of those areas. You have people who have zeal. They, they are high in their desire to please the Lord, but unfortunately they are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They have a zeal for God but they're not being given sound doctrine and so their life suffers because though they have a desire they're getting the wrong information then you have people 
who've been given the right information, they've been given the truth, but their heart is cold. They know the truth, but the truth hasn't penetrated their heart. Their affections are not set on pleasing the Lord. And so, and by the way, this can happen even after a time where the whole man was involved in worship. We, we read, for example, in the book of Revelation about the church um, at Ephesus that had lo- they had left their first love. There, there they were at, at a time, at one time, with their minds, with their hearts, and with their lives serving the Lord. But then they began to just go through the motions of worship, the motions of religion. And uh, the Lord was displeased. So it's possible to know the truth, but your heart not be engaged. And that doesn't please the Lord. Zeal without knowledge is not good, but knowledge without zeal is not real knowledge. If what you know doesn't affect your heart, then you don't really know it. And then it's possible to know the truth and in some way to have a desire to walk in the truth, but not follow through on it. You know the truth and you would tell anybody who would listen to you, you know what, I want to please the Lord, I want to walk in the truth. But then if you look at your life, you just don't act on it. And that's not faith. Faith requires action. Faith without works is what kind of faith? It's dead faith. Real faith involves action. You know the truth. Your heart is set on walking in the truth. And so you actually do walk in the truth. Now before we go any further this morning, I just want to ask you, do you still possess all three of those elements? I know this, if you're a true believer, if you're a Christian, there, there was a time in your life when all three of those things were there. You heard the gospel, so you had the right information. You understood that Jesus Christ is God, who came from heaven to earth, born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross in your stead, paid for all your sins. On that tree, suffered as if he had lived your life. And three days later, God raised him from the dead and declared to you through the preaching of the gospel the good news that if you would repent of your sins and place your faith in his Son... God would forgive you of all your sins, clothe you in the righteousness of his son, make you a child of God, change you from the inside out, make you a new creation. You heard that message, and the Holy Spirit of God brought that message to you in such a way that it gripped your heart, and the result was you repented of your sins, and you committed your life to Christ. So that at the outset, your mind, your heart, and your will were all turned supernaturally to God. Well, beloved, we are called to live our life in Christ the same way we started it. And I want to ask you this morning, are you still there? This morning, are you there? A mind informed with the truth, affections set on walking in the truth, and a life that is following through. Somewhere along the way, the Corinthian church lost that. That's what Paul's dealing with in these, in these chapters we're reading and studying. Somewhere along the way, they lost that. They had given their mind to worldly philosophy. They had given their mind to false doctrine. And the result was their affections were being stolen away from God. Their hearts were now being turned in the direction of the world, and the result was showing up in their behavior. Things are going on in this church that should never go on in a church. And the reason why these things are going on in the Corinthian church is because their minds were not right, and because their minds were not right, their affections were not right, and because their minds and their affections were not right, their behavior was not right. Paul has already dealt with one major issue going on in the church. There is sexual immorality being tolerated in their congregation, a kind of sexual immorality that even the pagans would not live in. You had a man in the church who had taken, in a sexual way, his stepmother. And though they had probably addressed it, the man had not repented and they, they were, the church was looking at it as a mark of maturity, as probably in the name of grace and love. They were doing nothing about it. 
And this man was meeting with this church week after week, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, while he was living openly in sexual immorality. And Paul is horrified. And he calls for church discipline. In fact, he has already pronounced the judgment on such a thing. And he calls on the church to act like the church of the living God, to discipline its members, to carry out a judgment that ought to go on within the body of Christ. He makes clear, when I wrote to you before about not associating with the sexual, sexually immoral of the, uh, 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 in life, I wasn't talking about the sexually immoral in the world. You'd have to go out of the world. But I'm talking about dealing with sin in your own midst, church. You have to do that. You have to deal with sin. You have to judge matters that the Lord has called upon us to judge. So he's dealt with that issue. But now we find in chapter 6, it wasn't just one issue. And it never is. When your thinking isn't right, when your affections are not right, when your lifestyle then begins to go south... You never contain sin in just one area. It breaks out in a multitude of areas. And that's what's going on in this church. Not just one sexually immoral man and the church isn't doing anything about it. But now you find out that the Corinthian church has been embodying the values of its culture in a multitude of areas. And one of the ways that they've fallen prey to worldliness is in the area of a love for litigation. They are taking each other to court. There are disputes between brothers in the church. But instead of dealing with those disputes like brothers should, they were taking their problems, instead of, instead of dealing with the problems within the church and forming judgments about the disputes within the church and rendering verdicts within the church and people abiding by that, they were taking their problems out into the courts of the world at the Bema seat, at the judgment seat in the public square and asking unbelievers to settle their lawsuits that had to do probably with lands and houses and business and things of that nature. And Paul is indignant about it. And this morning I want us to understand why why he was so troubled, why he addresses it the way that he does. And as we consider this this morning, I want us to broaden out our thinking for just a moment and, and not just think in terms of lawsuits. We need to take that truth and apply it to our lives. We'll talk about that today. But we need to broaden our thinking out just a little bit beyond just lawsuits and just think about our disputes with one another in general. Have you ever had a dispute with someone in the body of Christ? Have you ever had an issue of disagreement with someone who is your brother or your sister? And the question I ask you to consider this morning is, <clears throat> did you deal with that dispute in the way that brothers should? Did you deal with that disagreement in a way that reveals the kind of thinking and the kind of of affection and the kind of desire to walk in truth that Paul is going to talk about in these verses. When you dealt with your dispute, was your mind right? Was your heart right? And did your action reveal right thinking and right affections? Now we begin this morning with the manifest problem. We're going to talk this morning about the manifest problem. We're going to talk about the deeper problem. And then we're going to talk about the solutions. All right? how, do, how do you solve the kind of issue he's dealing with here? But we begin with the manifest problem. The problem as it was just easy to see sitting on the surface. Grievances among brothers. Verse 1, when one of you has a grievance against another. And by the way, in the Greek text there where, where, the, where there's the translation grievance, it's a technical way of referring to a lawsuit. So when one of you has a case a matter, an official matter, a lawsuit against another, or a matter that could be taken to law, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Now don't forget the connection to what we've learned already back in chapter 5. 
if you ask, why does, why does Paul deal with this issue right after dealing with the sexual, sexually immoral man in the church, chapter 5, the connection there has to do with judgment. Paul told them, we don't judge outsiders, but we do judge those within the church. If you say to me this morning, I'm not a believer, I don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then the church doesn't carry out any kind of judgment toward you or your sin. But as soon as you say you're a brother, <clears throat> and you take your place in the local fellowship, now there is an accountability one to another that exists in the body of Christ, and when any believer persists in sin, there is a responsibility in the body of Christ to address that sin and to call upon brothers and sisters to repent because we love each other. And we understand the destructive nature of sin. We don't just let someone whom we love go on a pathway that is going to destroy them. And if you're a believer, we know you have the capacity to turn from sin and to walk in obedience to the one who sets you free. So, those outside the church, we don't judge. Those inside the church, we do. The Corinthian church had completely reversed what God intended for his church. They were refusing to judge the matters within their congregation. They were refusing to judge those inside the church. They accused Paul of teaching them that they were to separate from those outside the church, which wasn't true. And then they were taking the matters inside the church to those who were outside the church and asking those outside the church to judge the matters inside the church. This was one confused congregation. Gordon Fee commenting on this says this, everything in the church is in reverse order. If the church does not judge those outside, neither does it go outside with inside affairs. I want you to notice something that he tells us about these grievances. Verse 3, he says, Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So one of the things we know about their grievances is that it had to do with things pertaining to this life. Temporal matters. Something else I want you to notice is how Paul viewed those temporal matters in light of the bigger picture. Verse 2, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try... And do you notice the next word that he uses? What does he call it? Trivial cases. Arguments about temporal matters represent to Paul arguments about trivial matters. You see, there's something larger than what's going on in this life. The things that have to do with eternity. The things that have to do with the souls of men and women. Those things are not trivial. Those things are of eternal importance. But the things that pertain to this life are things that in the, in the light of the bigger picture are trivial by comparison. So he regarded temporal matters in, in terms of eternity as trivial matters. I just want to stop there and ask you this morning, is that your view of it? You see, the real issue here is you have a, an eschatological community. That's what the church is. The church is a community of people who have been redeemed by God, and we have fellowship together now, but it's a fellowship that is going to last forever. We will be forever. We will be in the future the people of God. We're the people of God now. We will forever be the people of God if indeed we've been saved. And we have a fellowship, a connection with one another that's going to last forever. And the Bible's view, Paul's view is this, that that forever relationship should be kept in mind always as we live now. You live now in light of forever. You don't forget your future 
while you pursue temporal things. You don't forget your, your everlasting future and begin to focus on things that are, by comparison, trivial. So right away, if we're going to deal with our disputes the right way, we have to see them for what they are. If our disputes have to do with temporal things, they are really trivial things. Do you see it that way? Do you keep in mind the bigger picture when you are in a dispute with a brother or sister? Well, they didn't. They didn't keep that in mind. And because they didn't keep it in mind, because their future was not reigning over their present, they began to deal with their problems in a worldly way. They embodied their culture's love for litigation. It has been said by one ancient writer of of Athenians, Athens being close to Corinth, that every Athenian was an attorney. They, they, they viewed lawsuits almost as a form of entertainment. They, they loved get, going into the, to the public court and winning against each other. That's the world that this church existed in and they were embodying the values of their culture so they were doing it too. Approaching their problems in a worldly way, in pride and selfishness, trying to beat each other in court, standing at the Bema seat, which would have been right in the heart of the city, there in the public square, you have two brothers hanging out all their dirty laundry for the world to see. And Paul is horrified. Notice what this worldly approach, taking each other to court, represented in Paul's mind. First of all, he described it as an unholy boldness. An unholy boldness. Look at verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous? Instead of the saints. And in the Greek text, the word dare is placed first. Dare you do this? I mean, it is emphatic. Paul views their choice to sue each other about temporal things, trivial things. He views that as something that is very daring in a negative way, in a sinful way. It represents unholy boldness. Do you, do you really understand what you're doing? You are tempting the Lord. This is a daring act. How dare you? Not only is it unholy boldness, it is also, in his view, shameful. Verse 5, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? You mean to tell me, church, that you can't settle your problems? You mean to tell me, church, that you have to go before the unrighteous? You have to go before unbelievers to have an unbeliever settle a dispute between brothers? Aren't you ashamed of this? It is shameful that you would resort to such a thing. And then he says in verse 7, it's a failure. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. you. You view this as somewhat entertaining. You view this as somewhat enjoyable. As you go to court and you try to beat each other, do you understand you've already lost in the sight of God? The moment you step foot... Before that judgment seat, the moment you two brothers take your case before an unbelieving judge and ask him to settle what should have been settled between you in the church, you understand you have already suffered a defeat. Even if you win in court, you're the loser. Because you have disobeyed God. You're not acting like the church. So this worldly approach to their problems represented unholy boldness, shameful behavior, spiritual failure, but there's something else. It represents spiritual blindness. 
You can't do this unless you're not looking at things right. This church needed a, a vision correction. They're reviewing things from a worldly point of view, not from an everlasting point of view. It showed up in their desires, in their behavior. And he points this out. You're blind right now. Look at verse 2. Or do you not know? Look at verse 3. Do you not know? Look at verse 9. Do you not know? Verse 2, do you not know you're going to judge the world one day? Verse 3, do you not know that you're going to judge angels one day? Verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Have you forgotten the gospel? Have you forgotten your future? Have you forgotten things the way they really are? Have you become so spiritually nearsighted that you have forgotten the truth that you ought to be living in the light of? And I'll tell you something, this had, to, this had to penetrate deeply into their hearts because remember something about this church, as we've learned earlier, it's a proud church, isn't it? They view themselves as wise. They view themselves as knowledgeable. They view themselves as superior. And here's the apostle coming to them and saying, you know what, you don't really know anything. You have forgotten the most fundamental issues related to the gospel when you act like this. In fact, in verse 5, he gets a little uh, sarcastic with them. We've talked about it before, sanctified sarcasm. Sarcasm intended to shock them into seeing the truth when he says in verse 5, I say this to your shame, can it be that there's no one among you wise enough? You're such a wise church, you know, you're such a knowledgeable church, so you mean there's nobody there who can settle a dispute? Do you understand the failure, listen beloved, the failure was not just between the, the two brothers who would take each other to court. The failure was on the part of the church. A church that would allow that to go on within its membership. A church that would allow brothers to do that. It was a failure all around. Paul is so incensed. That ought to just speak to us all by itself. I mean, would this, in, would this cause us to be incensed? Two brothers in this congregation going before worldly courts to settle disputes that, that ought to be settled in the church. He is so incensed, he doesn't even really engage in an argument. Do you notice that? He, he simply does two things. He expresses his outrage, how dare you, etc., those kinds of statements. And then... Nine times in 11 verses, he peppers them with rhetorical questions. Notice all the questions. Just walk through it with me real quickly. Verse 1, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we're to judge angels? So, if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? Into verse 7, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Do you not know, verse 9, that the unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God? Nine times in 11 verses. Do you not know? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? He's saying, church, wake up. Think. Think. Is this how God's people are to be living? Is this how God's people are to be thinking? Something else he says about it. It's unholy boldness, it's shameful behavior, it's spiritual failure, it's spiritual blindness. There's something else it is, it's wrong doing. Verse 7, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Some of their so-called victories in court really represented ripping someone off. 
They were actually taking advantage of each other and they were using the court system to do it. And they were doing this against their brothers. And the church stood by and just let it happen. So you see, it's not just sexual immorality in the church, is it? You can't just contain sinful thinking, sinful attitudes, and sinful behavior in one area. It breaks out in a multitude of areas, and so here's another issue he's having to deal with. But notice something that Paul always does and that the Lord always does in his word. He doesn't just deal with the manifest problem. He gets to the deeper problem. That's the second thing I want us to think about this morning. Not just what you can see on the surface, but what is below the surface driving this behavior. Or, we could say it this way, allowing it to occur. What's missing in this church? First of all, there's an absence of fear. We see that in verse 1 when Paul says, Does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? So, so if you ask how someone could do such a daring thing, the answer is they are missing the fear of God that would keep them from doing such a daring thing. Can I ask you this morning, what is going on in your life, what is perhaps going on in this congregation that we may not know about? That if you feared the Lord, you would not be engaging in that behavior. Or to say it another way, do we realize, beloved, that we are living our lives before the face of God? Do we realize that he is taking note of how we think and where our hearts are at and what our behavior is like? Are we aware that we're living our lives before him in the way we treat each other? That God takes account and that God cares? Do you care about what he cares about? Do you care about what he sees? Do you care about what he loves and what he hates? And are we living our lives every moment of each day with that awareness that God is present and I am accountable to him for how I think and how I feel and how I live? It was lacking in this church. That's how they could engage in daring behavior. They just had no fear of the Lord. And I've, I've talked about it before. I'll say it again. Accountability is a good thing. You know, there's been a great emphasis, I think, greater than ever in the last 30 years about accountability in the church and having accountability partners and being accountable to one another about all sorts of things. But, beloved, there is not enough accountability in the world on the human level to keep a person out of sin if they don't have the fear of the Lord. Because there will always be some place where you are that someone else isn't. When it's just you, are you avoiding sin? Are you... Are you saying no to sin because you're aware that you're really not alone? God is there. Always. And He knows and He sees and He hears. And if nobody else ever knows about it or sees it or hears of it, He does. Does that matter to you? Do you know what the fear of the Lord is? How does this go on in a church? Because there was an absence of the fear of God. But there's something else. There was also, at the same time, an abandonment of privilege. This is a church that, that has forgotten its future and all the privileges that have been given to them in Christ that relate to that future... 
so that they were living in the present, abandoning the position of privilege that God has placed them in. Verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Folks, do you know this, that one day, every child of God is going to have some role in the government of Jesus Christ over this earth. There's coming a kingdom. The king will return and will sit on his throne. And the Bible says that those who overcome will sit with him on his throne. That is, in some way, we're going to share the rule with him. And it's going to relate to nations. It's going to relate to people. There are going to be people who survive life as we know it now, who survive the tribulation period. They're going to enter into the millennial kingdom of Christ with the same kind of body that we have right now. Believers, initially, all believers. But then there are going to be babies born. And, in, and there's going to be the need for a rule with a rod of iron. And we are going to have some role. It's, it's, it's somewhat vague in Scripture. We don't know all the details, but we know enough to know this. We will have some role in the government of Jesus Christ over this world. Daniel 7.21, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until... The Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Revelation 2.26, The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. The saints are going to judge the world. But then he tells us something else that's astounding. Verse 3, do you not know that we are to judge angels? And that's all the information right there that we have about that. We don't know what this means, except we know this. We will have some role given to us by Christ, given to us by God, that involves rule over angels. But why does he bring this up? He says, then at the end of verse 3, how much more, if one day you're going to, to have a... Christ will have made you competent... You know, notice he uses the word incompetence later. Is there, are you incompetent to judge these temporal trivial issues? Christ will have made us competent to have some role in the judgment of the world. He will have made us competent to have some role in the judgment of angels. Into verse 3, are you telling me then that you can't deal with matters pertaining to this life? Verse 4, so then if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? That is, that, that is not their future. They don't possess the wisdom of God. They haven't been set free from the darkness that is found in the kingdom of Satan and in sin. Here they are spiritually ignorant. He, he's not meaning to demean lost people. He's just pointing out the real spiritual difference between saved people and lost people. When he talks about the unrighteous, he's talking about lost humanity. You're taking your cases before the unrighteous. He means before lost people. And here they are in spiritual darkness, spiritual ignorance, separated from God, not possessing the life of God, not possessing the wisdom of Christ. And you, who will one day judge the world and angels with a wisdom found in Jesus, and you possess that wisdom now. You have the mind of Christ now. Are you telling me that you can't settle problems in your midst? You're acting like you haven't been given the things you've been given. And so the deeper problem here is an absence of the fear of God, and the deeper problem here is a forgetfulness 
about what our future is and all the privileges we've been given in Christ, all the ability that we've been given in Christ to settle matters of dispute. Beloved, listen to me. There is no true child of God in this place who hasn't been given in Christ what we need to settle our problems with each other. God has given us with His Word. God has given us by His Spirit the wisdom necessary to settle our issues. And when we don't do it that way, it's like we're, we're throwing away this unbelievable privilege that God has given us in salvation. There's something else at work here. A deeper problem. What else has happened to them is they have... They have treated spiritual realities like they aren't reality. An absence of fear, an abandonment of privilege, and third, a disregard for spiritual realities. Do you know why there are so many professing believers living a sub-Christian life? It's because, in, in many cases, what you say you believe, you don't treat like it's real. You say you believe it's real. You say you believe it's reality, but then when we look at your life and what you practice, you're living like it's not real. For example, he talks about matters pertaining to this life and he says they're trivial. How could you ever say they're trivial? I mean, don't you know... Paul, what this guy did to me in business? Don't you know, Paul, how he's trying to take advantage of me? Don't you know? I mean, how could you call that trivial? Because Paul treats the kingdom like it's real. And in view of that real coming kingdom, this doesn't really matter. He's not saying you don't handle business matters. He's not saying you just ignore issues. What he's saying is, though, understand how big these things are in light of your future. And in light of your future, they're not big. They're trivial by comparison. Do you believe your future is real, church? Do you believe heaven is coming? Do you believe Jesus is coming back? Do you believe there's going to be a kingdom? Do you believe you'll share the rule with Christ? Do you believe you'll judge the world? Do you believe you'll judge angels? If those things are not just talk for you, if those things don't just represent imagination and dream for you, if those things are real to you, then will it not affect how you deal with matters pertaining to this life? What's wrong with us, though, sometimes is we say we believe it's real, but in reality, <laughs> we treat it like it's not real. Well, I believe heaven's coming, but I better sure make sure I get everything I can get in this life just in case it's not coming. Oh, we wouldn't say that, but that's how we, that's how we treat it. Believers throwing away an opportunity to be useful for the sake of the kingdom of God now so that they can get what they think is their little bit of heaven on earth. Happens all the time. I wonder if we really believe our future is real. Something else they weren't treating as real was the difference between saved people and lost people. I mean, this is something he stresses throughout the entire section here, doesn't he? Verse 1, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the, what? Saints. You have the unrighteous and you have the saints. Verse 4, if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? What does he mean by no standing in the church? Again, this is not trying to demean lost people. What he's saying is, we don't have respect for the world's wisdom, do we? The world operates in spiritual darkness, doesn't it? 
Do we believe that lost humanity sees God right? Do we believe that lost humanity sees man right? Do we believe that lost humanity sees the world right? Do we believe that lost humanity sees the future right? And if lost humanity is in darkness about all these things, why would you take your problems and ask the lost world to settle it? In other words, is there in your mind a reality to this truth that there is wisdom from God and there is a kind of wisdom that leaves God out? Which wisdom are you after? Which wisdom do you have respect for? Which wisdom has a standing in the church? And hand in hand with this, another reality that they were forgetting was the fact they were brothers. Notice his outrage in verse 5. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother. And that before unbelievers. Verse 8, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Is brother just a name we've gotten used to using in the church? Hello, brother. Is that just a word? Or is it reality? If you're my brother... In Christ, if you're my sister in Christ, what should our relationship be to each other? Should we not love each other? Should we not forgive each other? Should we not be committed to each other? Should we not care for each other? Should we not protect each other? Not in a way that would ignore sin, in a way that lovingly will confront sin. Are these things realities to us or just words? And then there's another reality that they weren't paying attention to. And that is which side of wrong do we want to be on? If wrongs are committed, which side of wrong do you want to be on? Verse 8, or verse 7, he says, Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. You're so caught up in winning. You're so caught up with your pride and making sure that, that you get the last word and you are viewed as the winner in these situations that you are willing to commit wrong instead of being willing to absorb wrong. It would be better for you to be ripped off, he's saying. It would be better for you to be defrauded than for you to take this matter between you and your brother before unbelievers. You've already lost. In fact, you're doing wrong. If you have the choice between doing wrong and winning, or absorbing wrong and in the eyes of the world losing, but winning in the sight of God, which one do you choose? Would you rather be defrauded and be right with God or win in court and sin against God? Or to take it outside of the issue of law courts, would you rather absorb an offense from a brother and have a right heart toward the Lord or try to make sure that everyone knows you're right and have a bad testimony. Which one do you choose? You see, the deeper problem in all of it really comes to this last thing, and that is they were failing to love. 
They weren't treating each other like brothers. They weren't absorbing offense like Jesus. Christ is our example for absorbing offense. But they were too busy trying to defend themselves. So you had an apparent, uh, a manifest problem, but below the surface there's this deeper problem. The absence of the fear of God, the abandonment of spiritual privilege, a disregard for spiritual realities, a failure to love. So finally this morning, what is the solution? If we're going to deal with our disputes in the church like the church, if we're going to deal with our disputes between ourselves and a brother or sister like brothers, if we're going to, to think right and feel right and do right, what is going to be required? I'm going to give you four things and we're done. First of all, you're going to have to hate what God hates. We won't treat each other like we should if we don't hate what God hates. I've said it now more than once this morning. Do you notice how offended Paul is? Do you think he hates this? There's a question, isn't there? Why didn't they hate it? He says, how dare you? Well, why didn't they feel a sense of fear? How were they marching before unbelievers and laying out all their dirty laundry when Paul is so offended? What, why didn't their attitude match his? You see, we have to get to the place, we have to ask God to help us with His Word, by His Spirit, to get to the place where we recognize what God hates and we feel about it like He feels about it. Do you hate what God hates? Would you rather absorb offense than be an offender because you hate what God hates? You hate for there to be disunity in the body. You hate for the church to be a bad testimony in the world. You hate it. You hate for people who have available to them the wisdom of God to operate in worldly wisdom. You hate it. Second, we have to love like God loves If we're going to deal with our disputes in a way that honors the Lord, we're going to have to love like God loves us. The New Testament says that we're to love one another, we're to be tender-hearted toward each other, we are to forgive each other. Do we sometimes lose our tender-heartedness toward each other? Can't it happen in the midst of a dispute that we harden our hearts? That we stop feeling for each other? I want to use an illustration from the natural realm for a moment. Parents, have you ever seen one of your children acting like a fool? Right? In your maturity, by the way, let me be clear about all these illustrations I use. I'm not saying my children act like fools. I want to make that clear. I have to go home, you know. They have before. I have before. Who hasn't before? God hasn't before. Good answer. Little child in the second row. But outside of God, everyone else has. Now listen, have you ever known what it is to be tender-hearted toward your child even when they're in absolute ignorance? You may be dealing with a brother or sister who is just wrong. They're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. I want to ask you though, have you hardened your heart toward them or do you still have pity upon them? Is there a tender heartedness there? Is there a caring about them? That's how the Lord deals with us. Love them like God loves you. Do you forgive each other the way you've been forgiven? How has the Lord forgiven you? Are we sometimes... Like that parable that Jesus told, are we sometimes the person who's been forgiven a debt we never could have paid back? 
And then we want to take someone by the collar and hold them accountable for every cent they owe us. Do you forgive like you've been forgiven? Do you forgive from your heart? Do you forgive completely? Hate what God hates. Love like God loves. Third, think like believers think. It begins with our understanding. He's calling upon them to get a right mind. Do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? I want you to remember something, church. Remember what Christ has done for you, verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's you if you're a believer. You're not like the world, so don't think like the world. You're not like the world, so don't feel like the world. You're not like the world, so don't live like the world. You've been saved. And so have those people that you are in dispute with. They're your brothers. So act in accordance with that knowledge. Hate what God hates. Love like God loves. Think like believers think. Then finally, this is so important, and I think this is one of the reasons he was so incensed. Care like evangelists care. Here is the world, church, that you're supposed to be reaching here is the world that the church is supposed to be an alternative to. And you are asking unbelievers to settle disputes between two people who say they're going to heaven. The lost and dying world is one day going to stand before another kind of judge, a holy, holy, holy kind of judge, and they desperately need to be reconciled to holy God. And the only way for the world to be reconciled to God is through the cross of Christ, faith in the Christ who died for sinners and has been raised from the dead. And you say you know him. You say he's forgiven you and changed you and reconciled you to God. They need him and now you're trotting out your problems before that world and treating that world as if it has the answers. How horrific is that? You say, Brother Richard, do you think believers do this very often? Do you think they take their problems before the world? Oh, it happens, beloved, sadly. It happens every day. When the divorce rate in the church is about the same as the divorce rate in the world, then how many times have two professing believers shown up in a divorce court asking the world to tell them how it ought to all be broken out? What kind of a witness is that? And that's just one example. Do we think about our testimony? You say, well, then if we have problems, so we just act like we don't have them? No. If you have problems, isn't there someone in the church? Isn't there one person in the church? Just one who has enough wisdom, who knows enough of the Word of God to help you settle your issues? The fact is, if we're born again, there are multiple people in the church who have enough wisdom to help us act like brothers when we're in the midst of a dispute. Right thinking, right affections, right living, that's true worship. Tonight we're going to come back and look at verses 9 through 11 in a closer fashion. Let's bow together for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you that you've given us, as your children, everything we need for life and godliness. 
Lord, forgive us where we have forgotten what you've done for us. Forgive us where we have forgotten who we are in Christ. Forgive us, Lord, when our pride and selfishness stands up so that we care so much about winning that we actually become a loser. Forgive us, Lord, where we have forgotten that a lost and dying world needs you and we're supposed to be the alternative, the witness to that world of their need for your Son. And forgive us, Lord, where we've forgotten it in such a way that we have actually been a poor testimony in the world, going before the world with our problems instead of looking to you. Lord, where there's anyone in this place this morning who doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that they would look beyond an imperfect church and look to the perfect Savior, the one who died to save sinners from their sins. And I pray that even today, Lord, they would call out to your Son for life and receive the eternal life that is found in him the one who lives forever, the one who is coming again, the one who will rule and reign over this earth and with whom we will rule and reign as his followers. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.